started. So we are now recording. Um, okay, so today uh, we are going to do a review that I hope is the most boring thing that's ever happened to you in your whole lives. I hope that you know everything that we're talking about today. Uh, it's all review and it's a huge waste of your time. If it's not a huge waste of your time and you don't know what the heck is going on, um, that may be cause for uh, us to, to wonder uh, whether this is the right course for you, uh, because sort of the groundwork that we lay here um, is stuff from the prereqs, -re uh, and, and everything we will do builds on this stuff. So it's important that this is second nature to you guys, uh, and you've kind of got it figured out. But before we do that, we've got some housekeeping stuff to do. So let me. All right. So the Canvas page, you guys are seeing, you guys are seeing the Canvas page now, I hope. So you'll notice that um, I've posted the reflective essay here. Um, remember, these are extra credit. Uh, each one is worth one point of your final grade. So if you finish with uh, an 89% in the class uh, and you've done one extra credit essay, uh, that bumps your grade up to a 90%. So it does make sort of strategic sense uh, to do this. Um, let's see. So the first question is, based on your personal beliefs and your economics training, what are the top three aspects of the American agricultural industry that require government intervention? Uh, and beyond that, what are the specific uh, government actions uh, that you recommend? Uh, and so you've got, you'll see on that announcement, I hope that you've got 250 words. Uh, as a guide, I'm not gonna count your words, but I mean, you guys are grown ups. you should try to kind of stick close to that target uh, or exceed it. Um, I tried to set up a place that you can submit this stuff on Canvas. There's like an 89% possibility that I've done that wrong. Uh, so if I have done that wrong, uh, just actually, can somebody confirm, you guys are way more familiar with Canvas than me. Can somebody confirm whether this looks workable or this is the worst thing that's ever happened in your whole lives? All right, guys, we are off to a great start. Can I, I was yeah. going to tell you that I looked at it earlier and I think I looked at it earlier and I think it's all good. Amazing. Okay. And, and so Dolly, is that how I pronounce your name? Daily. Daily. Okay, great. So if it's wrong, this is all Daily's fault. And I need you guys to remember that. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, if, if there are problems, uh, just let me know uh, and we can get it figured out because I'm learning this Canvas stuff. I just pulled it up and I can see it too. Um, sorry, it was just taking my laptop a minute. Do you, I do have a question. Do you want us to uh, write it as a paper? Correct. It's not going to be like a discussion thread that we just kind of add to. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's not going to be like you guys building on each other. You okay. just type it up in Word or whatever you do. I think there's even like a text box. You can enter it in there. Okay. Uh, and then, yeah. Yes, thank you, Christina. All right. Other housekeeping things or questions about the course? All right, then let's dive in to what I hope is horrible torture. Okay, guys, so I need you to suppose that you are an agricultural uh, policymaker and you've got, you've got a question. The, your constituents have come to you and said, Alex or Daly or Christina or whoever you are, um, your, uh, you need to make sure that the corn growers of America are getting more bang for their buck. So you need to try to raise prices for corn. And there are a lot of ways you could do that, right? So one way you could do it is you could say, all right, I, the US government, am now going to buy all of the corn in America for a much, much higher price. 
uh, and then either dump it into the ocean or sell it back to the American public uh, at whatever price they're willing to do. You could tell corn growers to sell um, their corn on the market and then you're going to pay them at the end of the day, you're going to give them a paycheck, which is sort of the difference between whatever price uh, they sold the corn at and the price that you want them to receive. Uh, that's called the deficiency payment. You could require that all of the fuel used in the United States uh, is produced using corn, right? Using some share of it coming from corn. There are all of these different ways uh, that you could achieve this goal of increasing the price uh, of corn for corn growers. Um, importantly though, each of these is gonna have really, really different impacts on um, prices to consumers, uh, the costs to taxpayers, um, the, the well, to, to corn growers kind of total revenue as well. So the question is, how do we choose uh, amongst these uh, alternatives, right? So that's sort of the goal for this class is given that we've got a whole bunch of different policy alternatives, um, what happens, right? And so there are two parts of that um, that we're going to draw on economic theory. Right, so economic, our, our economic tools are helping us, us in two ways. First is called positive economic analysis, and the next is normative economic analysis, positive analysis and normative uh, analysis. Uh, anybody familiar with these terms, positive economics and normative economics? Just One's a, asking like a specific question and one of them's making like hypothesis theories about something. And uh, is it Hallie? How, so which, which is which and what, what does what? Normative. I believe is the not like scientific actual questions and the other positive is like real numbers. Yeah, it's, it's that's that's pretty close uh, in that positive economics, uh, positive economic analysis. The goal is to say, what are the effects uh, of this policy in terms of what happens to prices paid, prices received, quantities supplied, quantities demanded from these different these different policies, right? That's positive econo economic analysis. Normative economic analysis, like Hallie says, is a little bit um, more subjective. It's a little bit less scientific in that it says, considering these different effects that we've seen from our positive economic analysis, what should we do, right? And so for the normative economic analysis, the, the key word there is norm, as in norms, uh, we have to make a value judgment uh, in terms of one policy impacts stakeholders one way, uh, it may help one group of stakeholders and hurt another group of stakeholders. A different policy may have the opposite effects. It helps consumers uh, and hurts producers. Which of those uh, should we choose? And it just depends uh, on our valuation or our norms with respect to those groups. And so those are the two types of economic analysis we're going to do um, in this course. So let's first just stay in this world of positive uh, economic analysis. How do we do that? How kind of with the tools you've learned and then the tools that you've heard about and maybe haven't learned yet, how do we figure out those effects of different policies? I'll give you a hint that we did that last time, right? We, we did that with our Russia bread example. We, we figured out the impacts of this policy. How did we do that? I was gonna say the changes between the supply and demand and maybe like what the policy does now to the supply and demand. Does it increase it, decrease it? Does it change one or the other? Does it change both? Beautiful. And so Christina, you've, you've sort of summed up two different uh, steps in this thing, right? So the first step here is we've got 
uh, we've, we're developing an economic model of what the world looks like, right? An economic model. We're saying we're going to use either graphs and charts or, or some mathematical representation of what we think the world looks like. And so for our purposes, we're going to use um, the economic model of supply, demand, and market equilibrium, right? So that's what we used last time. We said we've got supply and demand and markets always clear. There is an equilibrium between supply and demand at the point where the quantity supplied uh, and quantity demanded are the same, right? Once we've got that economic model, we're going to do something called comparative statics, which is exactly the process that Christina, um, that Christina uh, described and that we did last time, right? So we said, for the Russia bread example, we said, before the government intervenes, if this, work, if this market works just kind of in a free market way, um, supply and demand would meet. And so we solve for a one policy scenario. And then we said, suppose the government puts in um, some intervention. In that case, it was a price ceiling for bread. And then we solve for equilibrium in that alternative scenario. And then we compared comparative statics, we compared the equilibrium outcomes, both in terms of prices paid and received and quantities supplied and demanded between those two um, policy scenarios. And then comparing those two policy scenarios tells us, did prices for one group go up? Did prices for that group go down? Um, what happened to quantity supplied? What happened to quantities demanded as a result of that policy being imposed? Um, and so that is, so these are the tools that we are going to use in this course. We've got the economic model, supply, demand, market equilibrium, and then compar comparative statics under alternative scenarios. There is a third part of this, which in my mind is the most exciting aspect of this that we won't do here. Uh, and that is... figuring out how to quantify those impacts. So the most we can say in this course is, did prices go up? Did prices go down? Uh, did quantities supplied go up or down? Um, the direction of those effects. But the more interesting question uh, kind of in the long run is, by how much, right? So how much is this policy going to cost producers, going to cost consumers? Um, what is this gonna do to actual price levels uh, or availability uh, of food, um, availability or, or, or ability of my family to feed, uh, to feed my kids um, as a result of these agricultural policies, right? So this is, if you guys get all hot and bothered about this like I am, this is what we do in grad school, right? You spend a whole, a whole um, chunk of your time figuring out how do we use statistical models, numerical models in order to really quantify these impacts uh, in an effort to inform policy. Okay, so questions about that. These are the positive economic analyses or positive economic tools that we're gonna use. Uh, these are the ones we're gonna use in this course, modeling and comparative statics. This is more advanced on um, what's something you'd do if you went to grad school. Everybody good there? All right, then let's dive into that economic model. Right, so back here we said the first step is making sure we've got this economic model in our head. So let's just review that economic model that we're talking about to make sure we all have the same thing uh, in our heads and we know what we're talking about. And so I said, remember it was supply and demand and market equilibrium. So let's start with demand. Somebody tell me what the heck does that mean? What is demand? 
it's usually <clears throat> measured by like how much like of a certain product consumers are wanting okay uh yeah and so you're exactly right jack so this goes back to the for me it was sort of the very first section of the very first economics course i took we started with utility maximization and how consumers allocated their scarce resource of budget across different goods right uh, and then if your economics class was like my class we went from that one consumer and how they allocate their budget across goods to looking across all of consumers to see how changes in prices at sort of a national level affected the total quantity demanded uh, at any given price level is that jack is that sort of what your uh how you characterize that i'd say that's pretty accurate <laughs> And so then, Jack, if we start from those fundamentals and we go from the consumer all the way up to the population, we end up in this space, right, where we've got price along the vertical axis and we've got quantity along the um, horizontal axis and we derive something called a demand schedule or a demand curve. What does that look like? Can be Jack, doesn't have to be Jack. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> that's the line. Um, is that the line that's, uh, man, I don't know why it's tricking me up, but that's the line that like is going in a nonlinear fashion, right? Doesn't have to be nonlinear. Let's make it linear. Let's just be as okay. boring as possible. So here okay. we'll, call, we'll call this the demand curve. Oop, that looks like a P. Oh no. Cool, we'll call this the demand. I'll just write the word demand. We'll call this the demand curve. So we've gone through weeks and weeks of class to derive this thing called the demand curve, which just ends up being this kind of lame looking downward sloping line. Uh, what is this meant to tell me? What is the, what are the big takeaways from this downward sloping line? Are you wanting something like the higher the quantity the less you want with the particular like downward sloping one that you've drawn here. That's exactly right. Except for don't, instead of saying the word quantity, say the word price and put that. Yeah. Price again. Yeah. Say so, that again. so for a higher price, you want a lower quantity. Exactly. So remember, this isn't just at the individual consumer level. This is a phenomenon that happens at the population level, right? So that if we have some given price uh, right here, we'll call this P zero at that price we'll get some quantity demanded q zero that's how much at sort of a national population level we will uh, demand of this product maybe it's corn or wheat uh, at the population level whereas if we lower that price to price p1 our demand increases so the law of demand is that there is a negative relationship between price and quantity, right? That as the price uh, goes up, the quantity demanded goes down. That's sort of the relationship described by this kind of seemingly boring downward sloping curve. But maybe if you guys are um, in the farming sector, in the agricultural sector, you're saying, Alex, what the heck are you talking about? You're talking about starting for consumers and their utility maximization. I'm a farmer uh, selling corn. I can promise you that I never see uh, a consumer, right? I never see one of those kind of end users. So let's be a little bit more uh, explicit in the context of demand for a raw agricultural product, who is it that, that uh, represents this demand for a raw agricultural product like corn? Who is demanding corn? Whoever's buying it from the producer. And, and, and so, so Lara, is that how I pronounce it? It's Lara, like rhymes with Tara. Lara, cool. Lara, who is that? Give me some examples of who that could be. A farmer. Oh, okay, so tell me that. Tell me that story, Austin. To use for like um, in their feed stuff to feed their uh, animals. Beautiful so. livestock feeders. Okay. Yeah. Grain elevators. Grain elevators. Okay, I need to 
focus on my writing. Okay, grain elevators, just so you can read it. Who else? Oil. Else? What's that? Oil. You say oil? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll say ethanol producers. Who else? Grocery stores. Yeah, so or or even like an inter intermediary in there daily, like a food manufacturer, right? So they're gonna buy corn and they're gonna turn it into syrup uh, or high fructose corn syrup, right? And they're gonna put that in um, some kind of food that they're then gonna sell to the grocery stores. Exactly. So we're gonna say uh, food manufacturers. So then. You guys are exactly right, and you know more than uh, more about agriculture than I do. But if we have, if this are the people who are demanding uh, corn, and the story I just told you a little bit about was uh, consumers and their utility optimization, uh, and these consumers don't have anything to do with these producers, how do we reconcile that disconnect? Can we still use this model? Uh, of demand in this context. Austin is shaking his head yes. Why so, Austin? Well, maybe so they know how much to supply, I guess, but also they're also a consumer uh, as well of the corn, so. Austin, that was super spicy, right? In that you said, so they know uh, how much to supply. Uh, and that's the recognition that all of these people right here, these are intermediaries, <laughs> right? So these are all intermediaries, meaning that these livestock feeders are purchasing this corn to feed to their animals who then mature uh, and then are themselves processed and sold to grocery stores or food service. Uh, and once those are sold, then it does reach that end consumer who's making that utility maximization problem, right? The same thing goes for these ethanol producers. The corn is sold to these ethanol producers who then manufacture it and turn it into ethanol that's mixed with gasoline. And then it ends up for those uh, end consumers, right? So even though these raw agricultural products are not being directly sold to these end consumers, um, we can still rely on this model of demand because these intermediaries are going on themselves to sell downstream to those uh, end consumers. And so this, this demand that we observe here is something called a derived demand. And so this is the demand for that kind of final product. The information in that demand flows upstream to those intermediaries who then demand the raw product based on the demand for the downstream uh, end users. Does that make sense? So even though the story we tell about how to get this demand curve is from someone who's very, very removed from the far, farm gate, the, the intuition, the logic here still makes exact sense because we are connected through these intermediaries to those downstream end users. Okay. Let's do this. What the heck is a shift in the demand curve? I can draw it for you. I don't wanna make you describe how to draw it. Suppose we've got this demand curve and then your professor who thinks he's so smart says, and then the demand curve shifts to D1. What is that? What is a shift in the demand curve and how is that different than what I drew on this uh, previous page, which was just a movement along the demand curve. How is a shift in the demand curve different than a movement along the demand curve? It's like a change in preference or income, not necessarily price. Okay, and so yeah, you gave me two beautiful examples of things that would shift a demand curve. Can you tell me what it is about those two things um, 
that causes a shift rather than just a movement along. And, and if you're saying that's way too ambiguous, I don't know what you're asking. That's okay. I think, I think what she meant when she said it, and she's just saying that nothing about the economy is changing, your situation is changing. So the, the graph isn't you're going to move, but the line isn't necessarily affecting anybody but you, right? I think you're on to it. Yes, you are. You're on to it daily in that um, these are changes. Remember, remember, so one distinction here is that this is demand at the population level rather than one consumer level, right? And so these are changes affecting that population, which are unrelated to the price of that product. So these aren't driven by the price of corn. Uh, and so, um, uh, Haley, I already forgot how to say it. Is that right? Hallie. Hallie, my gosh. <laughs> okay, Hallie. So I think you're the one that described, um, you said preferences and change in incomes, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so that's saying um, outside of this market, something happened. And so that's an external factor or something called an exogenous factor, which then affects my willingness to pay uh, in this market, right? Um, and so you gave me um, a change in preferences. Hallie, can you give me a specific example of that? Like maybe your priorities changed, maybe you became a parent and then something doesn't have as much priority for you to pay for so your like money is allocated differently so tell me that story at the population level can you give me an example of of in the past when that has happened i mean natural disasters cause a shift in what people's priorities are great and so for in the market of um let's go in the market for um toilet paper yes beautiful Give me the market for toilet paper. Tell me that story. I mean, obviously during COVID-19, there was an increase in demand um, due to toilet paper because uh, obviously people weren't able to go out near as much or they didn't go to work. So they were staying at home all the time. So you obviously had an increase in demand, which uh, shifted the demand curve over for toilet paper. Beautiful. The world got locked down and we were all trapped in our homes. And now I don't do my pooping in the office anymore. I do it, my pooping at home. Uh, and so I demand a whole bunch more toilet paper. That's not something um, driven by the price for toilet paper in this industry. It's something driven by uh, factors outside uh, the toilet paper industry, which was the lockdown, the quarantine. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay. So that's a, uh, that's an example of a change in preferences. Um, uh, Hallie, you said next that a change in income can shift our demand. Can, can somebody give me that example? Like if you somehow, maybe if you win the lottery, you're not going to drink Keystone. You're going to drink maybe like an IPA. And, and so something. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful, right? In that, um, so remember the distinction here is that we're talking at the demand curve is at the population level rather than just that individual's level. So it's not winning the lottery. It's like the nation winning, winning the lottery because we found a big pot of oil, a big oil reserve under our, uh, under our state or under our country. And now we're able to tap that. So we're all richer. And as we get paid more, absolutely. We're going to substitute away from the lower quality, um, alcohol in, in that in that example towards the higher quality alcohol. Beautiful. Okay. Anything else that can kind of serve as a shifter of demand um, besides preference changes, changes in, in income levels um, in the kind of agriculture space? How about this? So suppose that um, I didn't like chipotles as much as I do. Suppose that instead of chipotles, I like salad. Uh, I don't know why anyone would ever like salad, but suppose that someone did. 
Uh, and so a person eats salad every day for lunch. And then all of a sudden we see on our Google News, we see on the New York Times, a huge outbreak of E. coli um, caused in romaine lettuce. What is that gonna do to sort of our national demand for um, salad or our demand for lettuce? It'll shift it in. Dang right, I don't want E. coli, right? So we're going to reduce our demand um, uh, as a result of food safety information, right? So if we have these disease outbreaks, these food safety outbreaks, that's going to influence uh, our desire to purchase that commodity. Beautiful. And then I got one more. Um, anybody want to try on one more type of demand shifter? Isn't it that the price of substitutes changes? Beautiful, Grace. I mean, you just, it's like you saw my notes right here. Yeah, tell me that, <laughs> tell me an example there. Um, if you eat a peanut butter and jelly every single day for lunch and um, the price of peanut butter doubles, but you don't like jelly sandwiches, then you're probably, your demand for jelly is going to go down. Oh, okay. So that's a story of compliments, Grace, rather than substitutes. That was compliments. So compliments and substitutes. So I thought, Grace, you were going to start putting like Nutella on your peanut butter mm -hmm. sandwich, which would be a way better sandwich. I don't know why you <laughs> use peanut butter in the first place, but absolutely. That's right. So when the price uh, of a product you're consuming, when, when a price for a substitute changes, that's going to um, either shift you towards or away from that substitute, or uh, in Grace's case, it could also affect your purchasing behavior for complement, complementary goods. Great. Okay, we're almost done with demand, and then we're going to get to supply here. Um, a couple more co concepts. Okay, let me just write them both. Price elasticity of demand. What is that thing? Will you just shake your head if you've heard of that thing before? Okay, thanks. I always thought of price elasticity like a bungee cord versus a rope where- Oh, okay. If I need to have it, it's not elastic, the price goes up, I'm still gonna buy it. But if the price goes up and I don't need it, I'm gonna change how much of it I get. It's gonna stretch or it's gonna pull. So tell me which one, so, uh, that was beautiful, Christian, and I've never heard that metaphor before. Um, which is which? Uh, so if I have, so you're exactly right. So the price elasticity of demand is the concept of as the price increase, uh, uh, as the price increases by some percentage, by what percentage does the quantity demanded change, right? And so, Christian, you gave us two examples of alternative um, price elasticities. You said there was a bungee cord and a rope. So tell me those examples again. What's, what's the bungee cord? Well, if I'm a diabetic, then I'm not a diabetic, but we're going to use insulin as an example. The price of insulin, I'm still going to need it to be alive. So I'm trying to pull back my prior economics classes and I may be backwards, but I'm going to say that one is going to be your stretch to where even though the price goes up, I'm still going to get my demand out of it. Okay. Yeah. And so right there, you, so that was, by the way, one of the most confusing sentences I've heard, Christian, in that you said, if I'm diabetic and I'm not a diabetic, um, didn't make any sense to me at first, but I'm with you. So that uh, what you described right there is a really inelastic demand, right? That I have to have this thing no matter what. Uh, and so um, no matter what happens to the price, I still demand an equ uh, equivalent quantity uh, of um, insulin. Beautiful. And so then give me the example of the very elastic demand. Well, I have a huge Dr. Pepper addiction. 
But if the price of Dr. Pepper goes up, I'm going to look at other options. How dare you? Because Dr. Pepper is a necessity and you should never substitute away from Dr. Pepper for anything. Mr. Pibb is a sin. Uh, well, but when, when Dr. Thunder is like 80 cents a bottle, <laughs> Dr. Pepper is like $1.50. I got to really consider my options. <laughs> I think I still think you're a sinner, um, but I understand that you're on a student salary. So you're forgiven. But absolutely, that's right. So when we've got something for which there are a lot of close substitutes uh, or for something that's not a necessity, when we see a price increase, um, we're going to see a much larger um, change in demand as a result of that. Absolutely. Okay. And so then how, guys, does that differ from the income elasticity of demand? Is that referred to like, so say like if you're just like, like say your family and both you and like your significant other get like raises and you're able to have more elasticity um, in like a car because you're able to like look at other uh, types of cars instead of like cheaper ones or is that kind of a different? Um, so you just described the two of them. That's right. So the car yeah. example was um, if a price of a um, I'm desperately trying to find a small truck right now. And so I'm looking at the Chevy Colorado versus the Ford Ranger. Um, and so if the price of one of those changed, then um, that's the story of price elasticity, right? That if the price of one of those changed by what per, uh by what amount would the quantity of sales to um, Chevy Colorado's change if the price of um, Chevy Colorado's change, right? So that's the price elasticity. The income elasticity is the story of, oh, wow, um, we just discovered major oil reserves, uh, untapped oil reserves under Oklahoma. The sort of aggregate income level of Oklahoma has risen uh, as a result of that by what percentage does the demand for uh, Chevy Colorado's or corn um, change as a result of that in, uh, increase in our sort of aggregate income or our average income per capita? Does that make sense? So yeah, so the income elasticity of demand is the percent change in the quantity demanded for some commodity in response to a change in that sort of population level uh, income. Okay, so those are the big, big um, sort of heady concepts. How do they apply to agricultural policy? Do we think of uh, agricultural goods as being uh, so the raw commodity, the raw agricultural commodity as being um, more like the insulin story that Christian told or more like the Dr. Pepper story that Christian's told. So are these relatively inelastic, um, in price inelastic commodities or are these um, relatively price elastic commodities? This is at the population level. You got like a 50-50 shot. Anybody going to go for it? That's exactly right, everyone. It's so weird. So when we're in the classroom um, and, and I ask a question that no one wants to answer, everybody starts looking anywhere but, but to me, right? And you guys did the same freaking thing and we're even on a computer, right? <laughs> you guys were looking all around like I could see into your eyes. Um, it's just hilarious to watch uh, if you're me. So um, you're right, that avoidance of eye contact, um, I'll just go ahead and say it myself, uh, in that for these sort of raw agricultural commodities, we're very price inelastic, right? The um, purchases of corn, 
at the aggregate level aren't actually going to change that much uh, based on the price because corn uh, is a really, really small portion of our budget. That price doesn't matter very much uh, in terms of our the, its share of the final food dollar. Uh, we're, we're a lot more like insulin when it comes to things like corn and wheat than we are for things like um, Dr. Pepper, which is that downstream thing with a lot of substitutes. How about with respect to income elasticity? Is our corn demand very income elastic or not very income elastic? Still no eye contact. Let me ask you a question and you guys can tell me if this is something you've ever heard uh, in your life, all right? Oh, wow, the economy is really good right now. I'm gonna go buy some dang corn. Is that something that you've ever heard ever? No, right? So for the same, uh, it's sort of the same story there that um, those raw agricultural commodities are relatively income inelastic. Um, we're not going to change our purchases that much at sort of the national level um, based on whether we had a really, uh, we've got a lot of income per capita uh, or not so much income per capita for, uh, for a high income country like the US. Okay, so, relatively price inelastic, relatively income inelastic. And so for the purposes of policy now, if I'm a policy person and, I am and if I'm going to do something that's going to change the price uh, of one of those raw agricultural commodities, am I more worried about political outcry for something that has a relatively high price elasticity or a low price elasticity? Would it be something that's high? Well, tell me that story, Jack. Oh, I mean, um... you're like, ah, oh, frick, I talked. <laughs> uh, okay, so you said like, if you're like in policy and you're dealing with more political outcry, I mean, obviously there's gonna be a lot of debate and, um, I mean, a lot to like discuss if there's high like increases or decreases in price, because um, when you have those crazy fluctuations, there's always going to be, I feel like someone that's unhappy. Whereas if something remains relatively inelastic, I mean, you stay pretty stable. So, I mean, if it's pretty stable in the price and there's not a lot of movement, then there's not a lot of commotion, I feel like. Well, so that's, that's the story, Jack, is that, um, let me let me pause on answering your question or your your response and let me show you um a picture and see if you know who this person is uh this stopped oh that's okay do you guys know who this person is anybody know who that is you can quickly Google pharma bro. Anybody know who this guy is? Martin Shkreli. This has nothing to do with agriculture. It has everything to do with outcry for inelastic versus elastic goods. Well, let's just go to this guy's Wikipedia page. You want to? Uh, I can tell you, Martin Shkreli, uh, is popularly known as Pharma Bro. Uh, and the reason that he's popularly known as Pharma Bro is that he used to be at a very, very young age. So this guy's only two years, three years older than me. He used to be the CEO of a major pharmaceutical company. And that pharmaceutical company was the only one who, who had a treatment for a special, uh, or the only pharmaceutical company who had a treatment for some specific disease. And he said, you know what, guys? We're the only ones that have this treatment. It costs us $13 to make, but we got a monopoly on this sucker. So we're gonna sell it for $750 per pill. So these are the only option for this disease. They oh, it's for, for HIV, I think. 
they're the only ones that made this pill and they jacked that price up to $750 per pill. Knowing that, knowing there wasn't any other option, so this is a really, really price inelastic, right? No matter what, uh, no matter what price this thing is charged at, I have to buy this thing, right? Otherwise, I'm going to die uh, for those that have this disease. Do you think that there was a lot of um, pushback against this or no pushback against this? Noting that in the last paragraph here, he ended up in prison. I'm going to go with there was a lot of pushback. Dang right, right? Yeah, so uh, that's the story, right? So when we have a really, really price inelastic, this is something I have to have, and it doesn't depend on what the price is. If the price goes up for this thing, it matters a lot because we still have to purchase it. Um, that happened with the food price spikes, right? So this is a story that holds true for agriculture. When in 2007, 2008, food prices went up, there were very literal riots in streets uh, in some of the world's developing countries. So you can, you can um, Google the Arab Spring and see that that was sort of started out of those uh, food price riots as a result of um, sort of this increase in price for uh, very price inelastic goods. Okay, um, we are talking too much about demand. I got all hot and bothered. Okay, I am done talking about demand uh, unless you guys have other things to say about demand. Surprise, uh, supply won't take as long because I oh, won't. Okay, so going yeah, back go to ahead. your question about saying um, for policy, um, if we're wanting to try and change a price, um, would we want to change it for a high price elasticity or a low price elasticity? We'd want to do it for something that's very elastic then. If that's if you had that option, right? But so my point was agriculture is a really price inelastic thing. Um, and so the outcry, the political outcry is much more um, for changes in prices for these price inelastic things, um, which means we got to be really careful in agriculture. Uh, because we've got price inelastic goods. Uh, does that make sense? Okay, let's go to supply. I'm going to just start um, preaching at you. Okay, so rather than some industry level um, demand curve here, we've got farms. And these farms are speckled uh, across the U.S., and we derive the supply curve as the horizontal sum of individual farms, short run, marginal cost curves. Okay. Uh, and so we can do this because we know when a farm is a price taker which in the US farms are typically price takers, um, they will produce at the point where the price that they receive is equal to that marginal cost uh, of production. And so let me tell you what I mean by um, horizontal sum. So suppose we've got this marginal cost curve for farm one, we've got this marginal cost curve for farm two, and we've got this marginal cost curve for farm three. So this is a this farm farm one is is more efficient than farm three because they've got a lower marginal cost curve. Okay, so then the aggregate industry supply curve is equal to farm one supply until we get the two of them, and then it's the two of them added together. So it looks like this until we get here and then it's all three of them added together. So we get this industry supply curve that looks like this. Okay, and so for our purposes, we're gonna just simplify that to something that looks like this, just an upward sloping line. So the law, the relationship or the meaning of this line uh, is exactly the um, sort of dual of the law of demand, right? That as the uh, price of this commodity goes up, at the aggregate level, farms will supply more. 
yeah. Everybody's good with the sort of law of supply. Uh, and then, so tell me the story here. Um, we talked about shifts in uh, demand. What are some things that could shift the supply curve that are sort of exogenous from this market? Drought. Drought, beautiful. Yeah, so that's gonna, how does that shift our, our um, supply curve? That was like well, a dance. Austin just did a sweet dance. Did you see that? Go ahead, Laura. I'm sorry. <laughs> you oh, no, you're just good. grooving. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's a drought, there would be less product produced, so there'd be less supply available. Beautiful. Yep, that's exactly right. Okay, so drought. Uh, so that's sort of the uh, weather conditions, things like disease, pests. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Other things besides weather, disease, pests. Cost of production and resources. Beautiful. So have you, who said that right then? I did. Hallie, so uh, have you been watching fertilizer prices at all? No. Congratulations. You've made the right choice because fertilizer. That's a sore subject. Don't bring that up now. Exactly, Christian. Yeah, fertilizer prices are a freaking nightmare right now, right? They have increased by some crazy unbelievable percentage uh and what do you think that does so that's a that's an input we use uh into production what do you think that is going to do to the uh marginal costs which we're saying is equal to uh, our supply i'm not asking christian it increases our 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 uh, marginal cost of production so it's going to shift uh upwards that that supply curve okay um all right so we've got supply we've got demand let's put them together for market equilibrium okay so we said last time we said last time that for our purposes and in reality it's it's almost always true that markets clear right people are smart consumers are smart producers are smart smart they find a way uh, to get together uh, and so in equilibrium markets clear when um, we observe a market price p star at which the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded right um, okay so this is market equilibrium Another way to say that is that the market has cleared. And for our purposes, markets always clear. Um, I'm not gonna go through the assumptions that we need for all of these sort of graphs to draw. Instead, I'm gonna jump ahead to normative economics. So remember a million slides ago, we said there were two types of things we were doing positive economic analysis, which was describing what was happening to prices and quantities. That's what we've been working through all this time. Now we're going to the second question, normative economics, which is the what should we do? So let's go to normative analysis, which is the what should we do? Uh, and that is a really hard question which involves how we evaluate different stakeholders affected by um, a policy, right? So we've got consumers, we've got producers, we've got taxpayers that we care about. Um, and this normative question of what should we do involves, um, involves equating wins for one group with losses uh, for another group. And so what are, what are, What's a common method we use for this normative analysis? I'll give you a hint. The title of this lecture is Supply, Demand, and Welfare Economics. 
what is the tool <laughs> that we would use, uh, what's a common tool to use to measure these normative questions? It may be circled on this page, possibly. Welfare economics. Well, oh man, you are so smart. Dang, exactly. Welfare economics. Okay, and so welfare, gosh. Welfare economics. And so welfare economics or social welfare analysis uh, has us, we evaluate consumers, producers, and taxpayers equally in this market. And we're going to choose the option for which the total welfare across these groups is maximized, right? And so to do that, we're gonna consider um, a few things. We're gonna consider consumer surplus. So that's going to be the welfare outcomes for consumers. We're gonna assess producer surplus. We're gonna assess taxpayer surplus, and we're gonna assess dead weight loss. And so let's see. Um, consumer surplus, somebody wanna tell me uh, what the heck consumer surplus is? It's when consumers are willing to pay something and they're actually getting to pay less than that. Beautiful. And so, so um, I've, go ahead. That was all I said. That was perfect. Okay. So it is the, I've got this written down in fancy language so that it sounds fancy, but it's just exactly what, what uh, Daly just said. It is the excess social valuation of a product over the price actually paid. So we've got some supply, some demand curve, and we said equilibrium is where they intersect for this equilibrium price P star at which the quantity demanded and quantity sold is Q star. So in this market, Q star units are sold at price P star, but for smaller amounts sold, consumers were willing to pay way, way, way higher, right? So this is the excess social valuation, this area under the demand curve, but above the equilibrium price, this is the area of consumer surplus. It is the excess valuation uh, of the product over the price actually paid. Everybody good with that? You familiar with the concept of consumer surplus? Okay, how about producer surplus? Producer surplus is the bottom half of that triangle. You're exactly right. Why the heck is that true? Is that silence a hard pass? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of it earlier. And then when you asked, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even care. Yeah, you're exactly right. So the producer surplus is this area right here. And this area is essentially equivalent to consumer surplus, except for that it goes to producers. And this is the area, um, remember the supply curve is equal to marginal costs. And so for this product right here, the marginal cost of production was right here. And so we had this excess surplus of this much. For this product right here, the marginal cost of production was right here, and we had this excess surplus of right here, and so that happens all the way across the supply curve. This is the difference between the total revenues we've received for these products and the short-run costs of production for these pro products, which is essentially, if we were accountants, we'd call this profits, right? That's producer surplus. 
How about taxpayer surplus? What is taxpayer surplus? That's the Can you repeat that definition for producer surplus? You spoke a little too fast. Yes, ma'am, I can. I just got excited. So I'll, the easy answer is that it's the total revenues minus the total short run production costs for this. So the total revenues are P times Q. So that's this whole area right here. And then the short run uh, production costs are described as the area under the supply curve. And so it's this uh, area right here, which is roughly profits, sort of equivalent to profits. Good. How about taxpayer surplus? Let me give you a trick question that you should look at, at me and say, how dare you, Alex? Where do we see taxpayer surplus in this figure that I've drawn over here? It's not on there. Exactly. That's why it was a trick question. The taxpayers aren't involved. This was the free market. This is the equilibrium without regulations, right? So taxpayer surplus is just the amount of outlays that taxpayers have to um, shell out if we're providing a subsidy in this industry, or the amount of taxes we're getting in if we are um, assessing a tax or a duty on this industry, right? So we'll see that later, but we haven't seen it in this figure. And then deadweight loss. What is deadweight loss? It's like when there's a tax ceiling or uh, like a price ceiling and it creates like the market's not equilibrium. Um, and so Hallie specifically, it's called a market inefficiency, right? Uh, when, we're, when we're not in that sort of social optimum equilibrium, we have that comes at a cost to society. And so the deadweight loss is a measure uh, of that total cost to society of, of that market inefficiency that we've created. Okay, shall we work through one quick example uh, of this whole comparative statics going from the positive side to the normative side, and then I will let you guys go and live your lives. Okay, so let's analyze the effects of putting in a production quota. A production or this is a production or a marketing quota saying we can only sell X amount uh, of corn in an industry. Okay, so remember, we're going to use comparative statics to assess the effects of this production quota. So initially, we're going to say, if I want to know what the effects of this production quota are, I'm going to build an economic model of the market. So here is my economic model of the market for corn. And to assess the impacts of this production quota, we're going to use comparative statics. We're going to first solve for equilibrium before the production quota is in place. And then we're going to solve for equilibrium outcomes once the production quota is in place. And the change there is the impact of the production quota. OK, so the easiest question today, before the production quota goes into place, where do I see market equilibrium on this figure? Where supply and demand intersect. Dang right, Lara. How many times can you have to answer the same freaking question? Alex, stop asking me easy questions. Beautiful. Okay, so before the quota comes into place, we've got equilibrium price paid and received, P star. Equilibrium quantity demanded and quantity supplied, Q star. Now let's suppose that the government enacts a quota right here of Q bar. They say, you guys can sell at whatever price you want to, but you can only sell Q bar units of corn in this market. Now, how does the market clear? Let me ask an intermediate question, which is what is the new, with this production quota, what is the new supply curve for corn? So 
Don't you have the same like where the supply curve where it or nice. where the Q bar is? That's your supply curve. Beautiful. So before we get to Q bar, it's right there. And then once we hit Q bar, Q bar is the maximum we can sell. And so we've got in this region of the graph a perfectly inelastic supply curve, a straight up and down supply curve at Q bar. That is our new supply curve uh, with this quota in place. Where does the market clear? Blair, I'm coming back to you. I'll be honest, I spaced out. I was watching someone walk on the sidewalk. So <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> they must have been walking very strangely. Lara, the reason yeah. I can't, I, okay, cool. Just walking. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I came back to you, Lara, is because I want you to say the same exact sentence that you said the last time you answered a question. Mm, great, we're supply and demand intersect. Beautiful. The actual last answer was not nah, just walking. I'm glad you didn't give that. So oh. you're, you're exactly right. It's where the supply and demand intersect. So we said we have this new supply curve highlighted in blue, but you're exactly right. Oh, dead gummit. We've got the new equilibrium price right here. Uh, so this is the quantity or that's the price um, paid and the price received and the quantity sold right here is Q bar. So the question is, should we do this policy? Right now we're in normative economics. So I'm asking you, should we do this policy? No. Why? Because it creates dead weight loss. Well, how do I, where do I see that? It's that triangle. Um, you're, you're jumping ahead, Jack. You're giving away the, the answer, right? You're, so you're exactly right, Jack. Um, I'm sorry that I'm interrupting you. Uh, so, but let's, let's, um, sorry. Jack, you're exactly right. Let's work that out. Um, how do, how did you know that, Jack? How did you know that that triangle was the deadweight loss? With, uh, with quantity being like perfectly inelastic now. Yep. So the only set to make that amount of, or grow that amount of corn, but like you said, that they can fluctuate the price however they want. Um, but because of that, it's gonna cause there to be this dead weight loss where it goes to neither producers nor consumers, and it's just lost throughout the economic process. You're exactly right. And so then let's let's show that sort of um, in a step-by-step -step way. So I'm gonna label these different areas of this graph, A, B, C, D, E, F. And I want you to tell me consumer surplus, producer surplus, taxpayer surplus, uh, and then national surplus, which is the sum of all of them. And I wanna say in the free market story, the first time Lara said, where supply meets demand, what was consumer surplus? That was sign language for what, Lara? What did we, what did you just? <laughs> Nothing. The, um, the Somebody was walking. No was yeah, again. Some... <laughs> okay, but honestly it was. Um, <laughs> there was no consumer surplus. There is in the, in the initial equilibrium. Oh, Remember it's the, it's the area, it's the area under the demand curve and above ABC. the equilibrium price. Say it again. ABC. Beautiful. So it's. Uh, in that free market outcome, it's the area under the demand curve and above that equilibrium price. So it's A plus B plus C. What was producer surplus? C E F. Beautiful. The area above the supply curve and below that equilibrium price. Okay. D plus E plus F. Taxpayer surplus. False, good job. And then so national surplus is just the sum of the consumers and the producers and the taxpayers. So it's A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F. A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F. All right, now for the quota. For the quota, what happens to consumer surplus? What is consumer surplus now? Knowing that this 
is the equilibrium price. Is it just? A, beautiful. Uh, two people talked at once. I didn't hear the second thing said. I was going to say, is it just A, but yeah. You guys are both right. It's A. Beautiful. How about producer surplus? BDF. B plus D plus F. It's the area. That's exactly right. The area above the supply curve, but below the price is B plus D plus F. Taxpayer surplus. Stop asking about taxpayer surplus. There's no taxpayer surplus. So it's A, the national surplus is A plus B plus D plus F. And so now we can get to the impacts of this policy, which is just the change. It's just the difference between the comparison, the difference between the outcomes in the quota scenario versus the free market scenario. So what is the change in consumer surplus generated by that quota? B and C. And, and actually negative B plus C, right? So it's A minus A plus B plus C. We now have A before we had A plus B plus C, so we've lost B plus C. So it's negative B plus C. Beautiful. Okay, same story for producers. We now have B plus D plus F. We used to have D plus E plus F. So what is the change? The minus E plus B. Plus B, beautiful, yes. Okay, so we have, as producers, we've gained this area and we've lost this area. So it is plus B minus E. Okay, change in taxpayer surplus is nothing. There's no taxpayer surplus uh, in either of these events. So what is the change in total welfare? It's negative B plus B, so the Bs cancel out, and then it's minus C minus E. So minus C plus E, that area is a dead weight loss, and it's right here. So as a result, um, I think it was Hallie that summarized what dead weight loss meant, right? So as a result of this policy, we've created a market inefficiency, right? So we have restricted this market in a way that is not socially optimal. In doing so, we have cost our economy, cost our society, this area of C plus E as a result of that policy. Everybody good there? I'm pretty sure that 415 is when this class ends. Can you guys confirm that? Then we, I have to stop talking. So that's all I've got to say. I'll hang on in case there's any questions. Let me know if I've messed up the reflective essay. And we will see you guys on Tuesday. Thank you.